I will share some thoughts about COVID-19 models in epidemiology as they have uh, evolved uh, over the three years of uh, the pandemic and its evolution. So uh, it was a crash test for models and for science at large, not just a crash test uh, for uh, <laughs> this presentation. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, these models were used by both highly specialized and well-trained uh, people, uh, as well as uh, uh, and others who jumped into the tray. There are long-standing issues with models and with their epidemiology that became more manifest under the new expedient high visibility circumstances. Uh, this is one example of how many scientists tried to do science on COVID-19. Just within one year or a little bit more than that, 720,000 scientists published scientific papers on COVID-19. They covered all 174 major fields of science, and most of them were not really trained in epidemiology, but what they did was epidemiology for a good size of, uh, of that population. In another paper that we published recently in PNAS, we saw that 98 of the 100 most highly cited papers uh, in 2020 and 2021 were on COVID-19, uh, which obviously is completely e extravagant if we think that this is a very important topic, and really it is, we would have expected probably two or three out of 100 papers across all science to be the most highly cited to be COVID-19, but it was 98 out of 100. At the same time, we realized that much of that research had low quality. There's a number of empirical evaluations done by multiple teams that shows that uh, the quality of much of that research done in haste and very quickly and, and, and with cutting corners much of the time was very low quality and therefore substantially misleading in some important situations. Why would forecasting models fail? Um, there's many reasons for that. This is uh, one early example that we tried to uh, look at what happened in New York uh, during the first wave. Uh, we published that work in the European Journal of Epidemiology. And basically we saw that uh, some very basic tenets of running models were not there. For example, even the number of deaths, there were different sources from respectable venues that uh, gave different numbers of deaths for each day uh, during that first wave. So obviously a model that is trained on on data that uh, are not reliable and there's inconsistency may not do very well. Uh, we saw that there was major perturbations and major deviations of the predictions versus uh, what was actually happening. And in, in a way, the models were just chasing their tail. In, in, in a way, even the models by the very best teams were trying to readjust their calculations practically on a daily basis, but not really being able to come up with some reliable prediction of what was happening or what was going to happen. There's some broader considerations for failed forecasting. Forecasting is obviously very tough to do, especially in the setting of a pandemic with uh, acute epidemic waves, especially with coronavirus having such peaked epidemic waves that very rapidly dissipate after their peak. This is just a, a number of uh, problems that we have identified uh, in, in why forecasting may fail. We published that in the International Journal of Forecasting uh, in a debate uh, with uh, Nassib Taleb. Uh, there's many reasons. Uh, first of all, poor data, as I showed you. Uh, lots of models actually uh, are based more on speculations, and this can be even more wrong than data. There can be lots of wrong assumptions in the modeling. There can be high sensitivity of the estimates that are, is not appreciated. There's lack of competence in epidemiological uh, background uh, features that are not taken into account. For example, COVID-19 had a very steep age risk uh, stratification that was not taken into account in many of the early models, most, almost all. And even now, it's still not taken appropriately into account much of the time. Um, very uh, poor past evidence on what to do in these circumstances. It was a new virus, uh, a, a new situation. We had to try to, to glean what we knew based on what happened in 1918, which was a different virus and very different circumstances and probably not easily transposable. Lack of transparency of modeling, and I will come back to that. Lots of errors uh, in something that is done very quickly lack of uh, determinacy uh, that is a feature of this type of models. And importantly, looking at only one dimension at a time, for example, just looking at cases or hospitalizations or COVID deaths, well, actually what was going on was a multidimensional phenomenon that we had to worry about many, many different things about health and healthcare and repercussions on the economy, on the society, on uh, everything that was part of human civilization in a sense. Of course, uh, there's, uh, as I said, lack of expertise. It's impossible to make all these uh, 720,000 uh, scientists, epidemiologists, or modelists overnight. Uh, there's also a lot of grope thing and, and bandwagon effects that went into much of that modeling. Uh, I think that media and social media uh, run the show 
and, and then politicians took over and then it was very difficult to come up with something that would not fit to a given narrative. And finally, selective reporting, results that would fit to the narrative, even though much better results uh, that did not fit to the narrative uh, were to a large extent silenced. This is uh, one empirical assessment that we published recently uh, with uh, Manuel Zavalis from Karolinska, looking at the uh, transparency indicators of infectious disease models, not just COVID-19, but uh, uh, both COVID-19 and non-COVID-19. We, we looked at 1,338 papers of modeling that had been published in 2019, so just before the pandemic and 2021, which was a pandemic year, we saw that most of these models did not have even the basics of transparency. For example, uh, a very a small proportion of these models had been registered. Uh, I will come back to that on whether it is possible to register. We just had six models out of 1,338 that had been registered. Um, we had about 20% that shared their code, and we had about a quarter, 25% that shared their data. Uh, both code and data sharing were about uh, 13%. The vast majority of models could not be resurrected, could not be made to work in the hands of independent investigators. Can we register models ahead of time? One might say that uh, modeling is uh, completely exploratory and we should just be completely free to do what we want and not pre-specify what we want to do. And this is probably true to some extent because there's a lot of exploratory modeling, but there's a lot of modeling that can be pre-registered. For example, forecasting, when you predict what is going to happen, especially even more so if your predictions are going to affect whether your society will completely be devastated by the measures that you're taking, one should pre-register what the model is promising to do and what is the forecast so that one can compare notes uh, based on what you forecasted and what, what actually happened. Uh, so there are advantages and disadvantages in forecasting, but for, for forecasting, you can pre-register the forecast and then compare notes against uh, reality, against uh, what actually happened. And this is something that we have learned the hard way now that there's a number of collaborations and coalitions and uh, consortia that do this type of, consor of consortium level uh, pre-registration with forecasting where multiple teams can make their forecast, their data stamped and uh, their date stamped, and then they can compare notes on who did best and which models probably should be used uh, because they have better performance compared to others. Results of models are highly dependent on the choices that are being made. And I think that that was very prominent in many situations. I think probably the most prominent were the models by Imperial College. Uh, Imperial College has an amazingly competent team of uh, modelers. They're among the best scientists in the world. And I think that uh, they came up with some very nice models one model uh, very early on was published in Nature and claimed that lockdown was extremely effective just in the first wave, saving 3.1 million lives in Europe. At the same time as they published this model, they published another model, not in Nature, but it was available by their team, uh, that uh, uh, actually we tried to see how that model would work in the very same data. So we compared their Nature publication versus their other model, which was available at the very same time. And we found that actually the other model that they had produced showed that lockdown did not save any lives during the first wave, and it was other things, much less restrictive measures. Of course, we had to take some measures, but much less restrictive measures that would make uh, the, the, the main difference uh, in, in saving lives. Uh, uh, the same data, the very same team, two different models coming up with completely different conclusion. So which one is the best? Well, modelers have ways to look at which model is the best, and we use these traditional ways that uh, are available. And we found that actually the model that showed that lockdown had no benefit was much better, had a much better fit based on practically every single criterion that was available. So it's a little bit weird that Imperial College had available both models and one of them showed absolutely no benefit. The other showed three plus million just within a few months being saved. They could see that the model that showed no benefit had much benefit to the data but nevertheless, they preferred to publish the one that showed huge benefits from lockdown and created obviously a reverberation and, and a legacy that carried over. The same applied to practically every single country. The model that showed no benefits from lockdown had a much better fit to the data compared to the one that was published. So that was a clear case of selective reporting. Here's another example where there was a lot of debate with modeling, um, excess death calculations, which are pretty much the end game of a pandemic, uh, you want to see eventually how many people did we lose uh, to the pandemic. And, and this is a composite estimate, not just from uh, the virus, but also from the measures and from everything that has happened that has gone wrong uh, 
So there's several teams that have tried to calculate excess deaths in different countries. And I will focus here on high income countries because I think these are likely to be the most reliable. They're the ones that have very good death registration systems. If you try to calculate what happened in India or what happened in Zimbabwe, obviously you're just uh, trying in the complete darkness to understand what was going on because the, the pre-pandemic data and the pandemic data are both non-reliable. So these are two very competent teams that publish their data in Lancet, uh, IHME from the University of, uh, of Washington and uh, eLife, uh, two competent uh, uh, scientists working on excess death calculations. This is uh, the relative ratio of excess deaths versus those that were recorded officially in uh, uh, governmental uh, records for these different countries. You see, there's practically no correlation. There's slightly negative correlation between the results between two competent teams. So we looked across all teams that had published uh, data on excess death calculations in 2020, 2021, and, and we saw the same phenomenon. We saw that there were very major discrepancies. And we also proposed our own calculations in this publication in environmental research uh, several months ago, where we took account of the age stratification of the population. This is a sine qua non. I think, I think it's uh, impossible to really do any reliable uh, excess death calculations unless you take into account what is the age stratification, what is the age structure of the population. However, most of the previous evaluations did not consider that. They, you know, they just said practically that the population is going to be the same over all these different years. And this is clearly very far from reality. So for a total population of 1 billion in these high income countries, uh, 1.9 billion deaths uh, from COVID-19 were recorded during this period. Uh, E-Life uh, estimated 2 million, Economist 2.2 million, Lancet IHME 2.8 million. We estimated also 2.2 million without age adjustment, which is completely wrong. And this is what the other three uh, assessments had done. But once you try to adjust for age, you're down to 1.5 million. And if you look at specific countries, for example, in Germany for 2020, 2021, our age adjusted estimate was 43,000 deaths. Without age adjustment, it would have been 117,000 excess deaths. Lancet calculated 203,000 excess deaths. eLife, 88,000. Economist, 113. WHO proposed an estimate, then it had to withdraw the estimate because it was wrong. Um, Baum had calculated 22,000 excess uh, deaths with age adjustment. Koenig, without age adjustment, 130,000 excess deaths, and the recorded number was 111,000. In Germany, the number of people aged over 80 increased from 4.8 million in 2016 to 5.8 million in 2020. So unless you consider the change in the age structure, any calculation would be completely, but completely erroneous. And you know, this can show you what can happen even in a country that has the most reliable data, you know, unless you just take into account some very simple but subtle uh, corrections, you can get completely weird results. This is another approach, along with uh, Michael Levitt and Francesco Zonda, we try to uh, look at uh, what we call multiverse analysis, which means, well, if you have some doubt about which one is the best way to analyze the data, you can analyze the data in all possible ways. So you can consider all possible pre-pandemic periods as the control, and you can focus on whatever period you want as the, the projected period. And uh, this will give you a sense of how much variability there is in the results. So there is variability in the results in each country. However, practically, no matter how you want to analyze the data, some countries did very well. For example, out of these 33 countries, uh, eight countries had fewer deaths during the pandemic uh, compared to uh, what was happening uh, in pre-pandemic years. This includes practically the Scandinavian countries, including prominently Sweden. Sweden did practically best than anyone else, uh, almost uh, other than South Korea. And if you include also 2022 in the calculations, it did better than anyone else. And some countries did extremely poor. For example, the US, no matter how you want to analyze the data, did extremely poor. But you can also see that there are trends that go even before the pandemic. So for example, the US, we have a very big problem with our public health. We have lots of people who are marginalized, who are disadvantaged, who are faring very poorly. And we are a high income country that nevertheless has a lot of the population that is underserved. We don't have even insurance coverage for them. And not surprisingly, the US has not seen the life expectancy improvement that other high income countries have seen. And during the pandemic, when these marginalized people became even more marginalized, we were even, we were even more hard hit compared to others. And we saw the worst results. Actually, if you try to see what is the ranking of performance 
of these different countries, you see that for these two years, South Korea practically is always the best and uh, United States is practically always the worst or is always very close to being the worst. And, and there's very little variability in the ranking, even though there's variability in the exact estimates. So modeling can make a difference. And even some of the main components that go into some of these calculations uh, need to be questioned and need to be inspected for their accuracy. For example, one has to be very careful about uh, what kind of numbers uh, would be used for COVID-19 deaths. Uh, this is a, a paper that I published uh, last year in the European Journal of Epidemiology, where I proposed an approach that is based on, on traditional epidemiological theory that tries to estimate what is the over or underestimation of COVID-19 deaths in different populations, in different settings, in different circumstances, with different backgrounds of, of mortality rate in the population, with different amount of testing that is being done or withheld in early uh, waves. And the conclusion is that even in the same country, you may have undercounting of deaths, especially early on when you do very little testing, and you can have substantial overcounting of deaths, especially after you get mobilized, do a lot of testing. And most European countries did a lot of testing during most of the pandemic. So probably most of their death counts are substantially overestimated. We saw that in Finland that had to decrease their official counts of death by 40% recently after an audit. The pandemic has finished for now. Um, well, you, has it? Uh, I think by most criteria, one would have to say that it has. I, I dissected these criteria in a paper about nine months ago in the European Journal of Clinical Investigation. Practically by now, with the exception perhaps of China, almost everyone has been infected worldwide and the large majority of people uh, have also been vaccinated. So we have hybrid immunity. We have much, much lower uh, infection fatality rates. Uh, the reinfection is probably the main things that we see now, even for people who think that they're infected for the first time. Many of them probably are infected for a second time already, if not a third time. Uh, we have a lot of evidence that reinfections are not as severe, uh, even though they're very common. They will continue to be very, very common, I, I bet, in the future. Hospitalization risk uh, uh, is based on, on some estimates that we published in, in Lancet a few months ago is uh, four times lower. Death risk is 10 times lower compared to uh, what happened with primary infections. Um, this means that we still need to look at personalized risk, uh, which is translated as infection fatality rate. How much is my risk if I get infected uh, by this horrible virus? Because it is a horrible virus. Well, uh, we had a lot of data. We had hundreds of studies that uh, came to the rescue to try to answer that question. And uh, uh, in 2020, I published that paper in the bulletin of the WHO showing that it seems that there's tremendous heterogeneity across different uh, investigations, but the median value was something like 0.23, uh, which is pretty bad, but it's not as horrible as we thought initially. And at the same time, it became very evident that this risk had tremendous age stratification. So if we could specifically protect those who were at higher risk, we would be able to avert the large majority of deaths. Unfortunately, we didn't do that. Actually, people who were at higher risk were highly infected compared to those who were at lower risk. This is a paradox that I think that uh, we did very poorly. We let nursing homes to be devastated, people who had extremely high levels of risk, and at the same time, we were trying to protect children that had close to 0.000% risk. This is uh, uh, more recent data that we published in the European Journal of Epidemiology. We found that even in the elderly, the infection fatality rate uh, was four times lower, in fact, than previously thought for main pandemic plan planning. It was 2.2%. And actually, if you make adjustments for uh, proper loss of antibody titers over time, it's probably less than 2%, even for those uh, more than 70 years old. But of course, IFR was devastating in nursing home residents. Uh, and uh, I, I think that uh, they're likely to have had higher infection mortality rates in people who had very short life expectancy. Uh, this is some data that uh, will be published soon uh, in uh, BMJ Open with colleagues from Sweden. We looked at the national data. We tried to do a, a case control study of nursing home residents uh, who had been infected versus those who were not infected. And we saw that uh, clearly those who were infected had a tremendously increased risk of death in the first month. And that subsided by the end of the first month or beginning of the second month. After that, 
they had a risk that was the same or actually lower than those who were not in the infected group. Why was that? Well, because even in those who were not infected, the expected life expectancy was just a year and a half. And in fact, if you account for comorbidities, these people probably only had a few months of life to live. So pretty much COVID-19 killed people who had life expectancy of only a few months. And then once these sad events occurred, the rest of, of that population had a very, very good prognosis. This is looking at how steep the age gradient is for infection fatality rate for children and adolescents. The recent data that we have, including all the national sur prevalence uh, surveys, uh, suggest a risk of mortality of 0.0003%. Uh, I think that if you include just children and adolescents who are healthy, probably it will be much lower than even that, which is extremely tiny. Um, it is 0.5% in people who are 60 to 70 years old, 2% in those who are above 70, as I said before. And these numbers are substantially lower compared to the numbers that went into pandemic planning and led to the very draconian measures that were being taken. This is uh, showing the latest update that we published uh, uh, practically a month ago, uh, showing the, the very steep stratification. These are log scales in the vertical axis. And as I said, the risk is tremendously low in uh, young people, in children, adolescents, but even 20 to 30 year old. Uh, this is uh, looking at the difference in infection fatality rate in these national surveys, uh, depending on the population that is less than 50 uh, among uh, the general population. Uh, some countries, most countries uh, are mostly comprised of young people uh, around the world. Some countries, including European countries, very prominently Italy, they have very large shares of uh, elderly population. Obviously, you expect infection fatality rate for the general population to be higher in these countries, even though the age stratification remains the same. These are data from Denmark uh, looking at the, the dramatic decrease in the infection fatality rate in the general population at different age strata. Uh, you can see that, for example, even in the 61 to 72 year old, the uh, uh, infection fatality rate per 100,000 infections dropped from 281 to 15 uh, in January to April 2022 during the Omicron wave. And I think it continues to be in that level, if not even lower. Uh, why did this happen? I think it happened because of multiple reasons. I think that it happened mostly because most of the population was already infected. So these are mostly reinfections that we see at the moment, but also because I believe that vaccines were effective. How effective? Well, I think that they were effective overall. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details about how effective they might have been in specific subpopulations because this is very, very difficult to tell. And I, it's very unfortunate that based on the current data, we cannot tell exactly how effective vaccines are. Uh, I, I think that uh, there's a, a claims that vaccines save 20 million lives. I think this is completely exaggerated. There's claims that vaccines kill 10 million, pe 10 million uh, people. I think this is, this is uh, completely unfounded based on what we know. I think that they did save lives, but in this paper here, I have tried to dissect the reasons why, based on observational data, it's extremely difficult to arrive at any solid estimates of how much was the benefit that we got uh, from vaccines, even for the hard outcomes of death, uh, even though I think that we did get some uh, benefit, especially in the older age groups. I think vaccines were an amazing achievement. Uh, they happened much faster than we could uh, believe that they would happen, and I think that uh, Peter Doshi will delve into what that meant and what caveats that leaves. Uh, I think that they may still be a key modifier of the fatality impact that we see, that tremendous decrease in the infection fatality rate. Maybe they will play a role in future epidemic waves. We have to see. We have to do the right studies to understand if they will and how much. I think also that uh, the overall perception about vaccines was uh, unfortunately misconstrued. Uh, very early uh, when they started being used, I published that paper in um, uh, NPJ vaccines, where I estimated that if their efficacy is not really 100%, uh, then you have the risk of risk compensation, which means that uh, it you could have a major problem of vaccines not being able to do anything or next to anything uh, for transmission. So, so you, you would continue seeing uh, a lot of transmission happening, and this is exactly what we saw. I, I think that Unfortunately, vaccines were oversold in that dimension. They were sold as something that would stop the epidemic wave. I think they had practically no impact on the epidemic wave. 
maybe they had a little bit in some locations, maybe they had a negative impact because of risk compensation in other locations. Conditional vaccine effectiveness is what you get from a vaccine once you are infected. And I think that you can calculate that. Uh, this is a, 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 a theoretical paper that I published a few months ago where I tried to estimate how much is the conditional vaccine effectiveness for someone who's already infected. But the caveat here is that these are, are, not, are not causal estimates. These are observational estimates. So one has to be very, very careful. So where do we go from here? Well, the pandemic is over. We're in the endemic phase. Uh, are we going to go ahead with multiple boosters now and then? Maybe not. Hopefully not. Uh, although I cannot tell you because I don't know what the next variants are going to look like, whether they will be less, more, uh, or equally lethal as those that we have faced and what previous infection and previous vaccination would mean. These are some calculations that we run for numbers needed to treat to prevent one COVID-19 deaths and for the cost to prevent one COVID-19 deaths for the fourth dose of mRNA vaccines. Most of these numbers that look horribly high. So, so you know, they, they might uh, be considered, but I, I think that uh, they're really prohibitive for the large majority of the population for these vaccines to, to be used uh, repeatedly, unless there's really some good reason about it. Uh, and we can have some good documentation that they save lives at, at, in a way that there's other interventions that uh, uh, cannot do. Decision-making, personal and public, I think must be multidimensional. We need to consider multiple aspects. Epidemiology and modeling is not one-sided. We need to consider all the other aspects of impacts on society, on health, on mental health, on physical health, on other diseases, what happens with, with screening for cancer, for example, or cancer services, if we use draconian measures and we shut down hospitals or we divert care uh, towards uh, just COVID-19. We need to try to take all of that into account with the best possible evidence. And the best possible evidence is unlikely to come just from modeling and observational data. We need randomized trials. This is something that many of us have struggled to communicate since the beginning of the pandemic. We need more randomized trials on interventions. There's no alibi. There's no excuse. Why not do them? If we don't do that, I think we're likely to fall into a vicious circle of repeated crisis. I think that uh, we will see all the problems that have, have all been compounded. We will see lots of problems with the disruption that lockdowns caused that were eventually proven to be a horrible idea. I think that uh, we will see uh, lots of problems from people who are marginalized, from people who lose trust in public health, from people who don't want to be vaccinated, even though we have very effective vaccines because they don't trust anything that we tell them that uh, are also creating a problem for the legacy of how we handle crisis in, in the future. Bottom line, uh, how do we deal with diminishing the impact and the, the footprint of a pandemic? We need to deal with the factors that are underlying all the deaths that happen. We need to work around social injustice, inequalities, racism, and poverty, and try to solve these major problems. Smoking, um, another major problem that is, is uh, active multiplicatively with, uh, with COVID-19. Other modifiable risk factors in lifestyle, obesity was a very strong risk factor for death. And in some countries like the U.S., we have 40 percent of the population being obese uh, and it's becoming uh, worse and worse over time. Very poor protection of nursing homes. Nursing homes uh, were abandoned or even worse. Sometimes we had people with COVID-19 infections sent uh, to nursing homes and we had massive infections there. Uh, many of the nursing home residents also suffered from from negligence, from abandonment, from, you know, they just died because of lack of food and, and water practically. Poor adoption of effective public health measures. Uh, if we lose trust in public health, this is going to be the worst that can happen to us. Adoption of harmful pro-contagion public health measures, for example, blind draconian lockdowns. It's very unfortunate that China has continued down that recipe. I think everyone else practically has been convinced that this is a horrible idea. Suboptimal and harmful treatments and medical care and lack of effective vaccination, lack of convincing for effective vaccination or inefficient vaccination strategies. Pandemic preparedness, and I will close with this slide, we need to be well prepared, there's no doubt about it, but pandemic preparedness should not disrupt life. It should happen in a way that people continue to live their lives uh, and they don't feel threatened all the time. Pandemic preparedness requires evidence, reproducible evidence, evidence from the best types of designs, not just modeling including my own modeling, which may be completely wrong. Conversely, we should improve living conditions and opportunities, especially for those who are in need and for those who are disadvantaged. We need to build and maintain trust in public health 
and we need to see the big picture and not lose track of the big picture. I will close with uh, just mentioning, uh, with many thanks, uh, a number of my colleagues uh, who worked with me during the pandemic on doing the research that I shared with you. I think that I published papers with uh, more than 400 other scientists uh, during the pandemic on COVID-19 and with uh, more than 6,000 uh, scientists overall. I, I'm completely indebted to them for showing me my errors and for uh, improving my work. And I'm also very thankful to you for, for listening. Thank you.